Hello and welcome to Summit Avenue Online and still at home. Uh, so I left for vacation in early July and at staff meetings and with our COVID response team, we were talking about, hey, let's go ahead and try to plan for some outdoor in-person services come August. Well, now I'm back and it's August and yet there's lots of new cases in Kitsap County and the public health recommendations this week. Uh, yeah, they're saying maybe we shouldn't rush that. And so our response team met this week and we made the decision unanimously that we're gonna just keep doing what we're doing with these online services and still meet in our small groups. Some of people are meeting outdoors on patios in limited numbers and really enjoying that time together and feeling safe in doing that. And we have some groups still meeting online. So we're gonna keep, keep doing that. And yeah, we wanna hear from you. We wanna hear how you're doing and how we can support you in these coming weeks um, in our worship services, in our small groups, in our service projects, in our ministry. So how can we support you? So be looking for another quick survey in your email in the coming days and uh, we wanna hear from you. All right, let's begin our worship with the lighting of our candle. This is our candle prayer and the candle of Christ. We proclaim Jesus as Lord and Savior and light of the world. And so we center our worship services and our whole lives around the light of Christ. Come, let us worship the Lord. So I'm outside in my garden today to introduce you to something new we're adding to our worship services that we're calling Moments of Grace. I know that so many of you are being creative and keeping busy with projects, um, crafts, uh, getting outdoors and going for hikes. And some of that is simply to pass the time. I mean, let's be honest, we have some time on our hands, some of us, uh, but also, we are created in the image of a creative God 
And when we work with our hands and our minds to create something new, uh, or we immerse ourselves in God's creation, God pours something into our souls. Uh, we find peace. We find calm. Uh, we breathe more deeply. We sleep more easily. And God's graces come to us in so many ways. For me, it's being outdoors in my garden, uh, digging in the dirt, watching the zucchini grow and the pumpkins just take over a hillside, um, listening to the goofy chickens, uh, and even pulling weeds. God's Spirit speaks to me new insights into myself, into the weeds of my soul, or to the needs of the world. Uh, just new insights God speaks. And also, uh, I just lose myself in the work and hours will just disappear. And then I realize my soul is restored. I also know that we miss seeing one another. We miss seeing faces saying each other's names, hearing how people are doing and laughing and sharing life together. And so each week we are going to see friends in their homes and in their gardens and on their decks and maybe out in the woods um, to hear from them a little about what they've been up to and not just filling the time, but also what they've been doing that's filling their souls. And so to kick off our Moments of Grace series, or our segment, is it okay to call it a segment in a worship service? It feels like that's okay these days. Um, this week I put my mask on and went over to visit with Paul and Char Dufresne in their home and to hear what they've been up to and what Moments of Grace they've been experiencing in this stay-at-home time. I asked if I could talk about something that I found a comfort and um, a way to spend this time um, less stressful and more, um, I guess, productive. And of course, one of the things I do a lot of is baking. So I'm showing you some rye bread I mixed up this morning. The um, mixing the bread's not, eh, it's a lot of fun to watch, but you weren't here until just now. Um, and watching it rise is sort of like watching paint dry, so they've got no excitement there. But what you'll see is the kneading process and the loaves, and uh, maybe get a sense of um, how much I enjoy it and why I do. After this dough is had about an hour and a half or, or so, um, this particular dough, because it's rye, is, rises very, very well. It gives me a very big rise. As you can see, there's a lot of dough in this bowl. I've had this bowl forever, and it's it's my bread making bowl and because it's rye it's uh, a whole lot stickier than some of the breads I make but I really like this um, rye bread because and you can't smell it in, in the video it has a great aroma even when it's yeasty like this before I get it before I get it baked um, and all the kneading does is stretch out the gluten in the dough so that it will hold the yeast bubbles um, as it rises before before it goes into the oven and then even after it goes into the oven. A lot of bread making is, um, is feel. After you've done it a while, you get a sense for where the, where the dough is by how it feels and how the skin on it warms up. With this particular dough, it gets sticky, but it makes a very nice loaf and that you can see it well there. So, I have bread pans, I just went to get one. I'll punch this down in the pan, and then make the next ones. I started making bread um, a few years ago when I changed careers, and I was in the midst of looking for a, a new job. This Stressful. And so with this, the downtime that I had, I started baking, started baking bread. Um, and it gets very satisfying, it's very hands-on, um, it, it rewards you, the, the, the amazing thing about yeast and, and flour and, and water is it will make a very um, 
satisfying, simple meal, and it will nourish, nourish you. Um, and I guess it's the nourishment I get out of the process of making it that that is the most satisfying for me right now. I'm at home on my deck. I can see Kitsap Lake and the Olympic uh, Mountains. I can see the brothers right here in my uh, backyard. So this is where I spend most of my time. <laughs> and since I have a little husband who likes to cook, I'm taking advantage of it. So this is acrylics and acrylics are kind of a, a good way to play because you can always cover up what you don't like. And in fact, I would encourage anybody who is bored to just get a little set of acrylics and play because it gives you something to do and it really feels good to use bright color. If you don't like it, you can cover it up and start over. Okay, I've been kind of playing with um, this pond. It's gonna have a koi and I'm gonna put a lot of water hyacinths in there. My parents used to have a, a koi pond. So I took photos years ago of their water hyacinths and uh, trying to decide what color to paint the fish. I'm thinking this probably needs yellow. So I'm gonna put a couple of different shades out here. And when the fish pleases me eventually, I'll go over it with a little bit of brief, a little bit of blue or some white so that it looks like there's a reflection and it looks like it's in the water and not just kind of floating on the top. Painting is usually about using lots of different layers. And the fun thing about painting with acrylics is they dry so fast that you can layer over what you have. I do miss everyone, <laughs> but I have to say I'm really learning to like being home. <laughs> it's a joyful hobby. Um, it just feels good. I, I didn't start until late in life, after I'd earned a living and all the things you have to do. And it's been more fun than I ever thought it could be. But it feels so good to play with color. I can be out here for what feels like an hour and it might be all day long. I think that I feel more spiritual peace and communication with, with creation, with, with God, with um, all things spiritual, more when I'm painting than at any other time. And since painting is quite new for me, well, in the last 10 years, it's, I guess it's been an, an important part of my spiritual journey. Uh, well, 24 minutes later at 4.50, three loaves of rye bread, that easy. Wasn't that so wonderful? I love that they discovered baking and painting only in recent years. Uh, God has so many graces to pour out into our lives in every season. What about you? What have you been up to in this COVID-19 uh, stay-at-home time? Where have you been finding God filling your spirit and renewing your soul? Maybe it's gardening and baking and painting. Uh, we'd love to see that. We'd love to share that with you and hear about it. Maybe it's woodworking or quilting or walking in the woods. Uh, I know some of you uh, are cleaning and organizing and that really just speaks to your soul. I have a little bit of that in me. So we'd love to hear from you and share what you've been up to in our moments of grace. So give Woody a call or drop him an email or contact me or Deanna. And you can record it yourself if you feel comfortable doing that and just we can figure out a way to send that to us. Or uh, we'd be happy to come to you and take care of all the tech for you and record that and take care of it. So we want to see you and be encouraged by God's grace in your life.
Before I begin today's scripture reading, I just want to show you where I am. I'm at the Lillian and James Walker Park in West Bremerton. There is this hillside with beautiful seating behind me, and then also this gorgeous labyrinth for those of you who enjoy and appreciate the discipline of walking a labyrinth. And then over here, we're on Anderson Cove. Uh, the water here, the tide is out right now. And uh, I just wanted to give you this scene as we begin today's scripture reading from Matthew chapter 14, beginning in verse 13. When Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and healed their sick. We're gonna stop there because there's so much going on here. First of all, Jesus just can't catch a break. <clears throat> what had happened was that Jesus has just heard the news that his cousin John, who had baptized Jesus and multitudes of others at the Jordan River, has just been cruelly executed at Herod's palace. Jesus is in deep grief and needs to get away, be alone. We get that, don't we? That need to grieve and just to be by ourselves sometimes. And Jesus gets it. When we grieve, when we hear news that is hard of more death, more disease, more division in our world. And we just want to get away from it all. But even in his grief, in his desire to be alone, Jesus doesn't get angry at being bothered. Instead, he has compassion. Literally, the Greek says, his heart went out to them and he healed their sick. We may be overwhelmed with news of the world and it is okay to take pause and grieve a while, but we cannot stay isolated from it all. There is always work to do in the healing of this world. So secondly, there's this line, the crowds followed him 10 times in the Gospel of Matthew, that phrase is used. They, a group of people, the crowds or the disciples, they followed Jesus. And this phrase is paired with actions like, Jesus heals the sick, casts out demons, calms the storm, gives sight to the blind, hearing to the deaf, and in today's lesson, Jesus feeds a multitude. The pattern is this. When people follow Jesus, miracles happen. And by people, I mean in community people, people together. So Matthew's, what Matthew is saying is that the way to experience the miraculous is found in following Jesus with others. I think of our own church in this last year and a half. Beginning in 2019, the beginning of 2019, we said, we don't know the future. We don't know what the future holds, but let's commit to following Jesus together through a season of discernment and see what rivers he will lead us to cross. So we met in small groups, in town halls, in committees, uh, with Presbytery. Uh, we, we prayed, we were in scripture, we listened to each other and to the word, and we were following Jesus together. And we experienced extraordinary moments, didn't we? Yeah, which culminated in a grant from the Seattle Presbytery and bringing Deanna onto our staff to help us grow our own church and to grow in our connections with our community. In 2019, we also said, let's follow Jesus together and ask him to show us God's heart for inclusion. So we dug into scripture. We heard stories from our LGBTQ siblings and allies. 
and we wrestled with long-held interpretations and doctrines. And on that road with Jesus together, we saw amazing things. Miraculous love and grace and transformation. I also cannot imagine our church. Where would we be, Summit Avenue, right now, without the gifts and kindness and leadership of our gay church members and friends? Yeah, when people follow Jesus, miracles happen. Now in 2020, eight months into a year unlike any of us have ever experienced or could even imagine. What are we doing? We're continuing to follow Jesus together. I know we've already experienced some miracles. I mean, look at how many people can get on Zoom these days. That right there is a miracle, amen? <clears throat> so I joke a little bit, but really technology is a miracle and how we are connecting right now and how we are together following Jesus. So we're so grateful for technology. Okay, so the crowds that followed Jesus that day by the seashore, <clears throat> They followed Jesus. They didn't know what was going to happen next. They just kept following. Friends, we do not know what lies ahead. We do not know what is next. What we do know is that following Jesus is the best way forward. In Jesus, we're in good hands. Okay, so moving along to verse 15. <clears throat> As evening approached... The disciples came to Jesus and said, This is a remote place, and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. You gotta love the disciples. They're so practical, so focused on the logistics, so not wanting to be bothered. <clears throat> They're like, It's late. Um, we're far from the store. <clears throat> These people are hungry. Can you just tell them to go away? Verse 16, Jesus replied, They do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. I can only imagine Jesus saying this with a twinkle of mischief in his eyes because he knows what he's got up his sleeve. He says, No, they don't need to leave. You feed them. <clears throat> and then verse 17, we have here only five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. So <clears throat> it helps add a little salt and sarcasm to the reading at this point. Because the disciples are basically saying, yeah, <clears throat> we'll get right on that, Jesus, since we have exactly five loaves and two fish. So here's where the air starts to shimmer, the story shifts, and the miracle begins to unfold. Verse 18, bring them here to me, Jesus said. See, the disciples have only counted to seven. Five loaves, two fish. The only reality they can see. <clears throat> but there's another reality, capital R reality, standing right there in their midst. As Bible scholar Dale Bruner writes, the disciples should have counted to eight. We have so much to learn from this story. Bring them here to me means that in prayer and in active obedience, we give to Jesus everything we have, no matter how insignificant it may seem, and trust <clears throat> that Jesus will bless it and multiply it. Verse 19, and he directed the people to sit down on the grass, taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to the disciples and the disciples gave them to the people. They all ate and were satisfied and the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. It is no accident that when Jesus distributes the bread, 
we hear echoes of the Lord's Supper. He took the bread and looking up to heaven, he blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples. And then his disciples gave it to the people. We often think that communion is just for us church folk to be nourished and to be connected to God. And yes, we are spiritually nourished. And yes, we are connected with God and with one another in communion. But the sacrament is so much bigger than that. God's heart is that the hungry world be fed. And in communion, Jesus fuels the church for the feeding of the world. Taking something small, giving it to those who follow so that they can give it to others and blessing it all so that it multiplies so much that there are baskets of leftovers. Now verse 21, the number of those who ate was about 5,000 men besides women and children, literally not counting women and children. Sorry, ladies and kids, that's just how things got counted and recorded. Only the men were counted because only the men were doing the counting. We women and our young children were often not counted in the patriarchal societies of human history. But here's the miracle inside the miracle. Jesus took everyone into account. He fed them all. Society may not count some as worthy of inclusion, but that's not the case with Jesus. <clears throat> with Jesus, everyone counts. With Jesus, everyone is fed. With Jesus, everyone is loved and everyone is forgiven. May we be people who follow Jesus together and multiply the miracle of feeding and loving and extending grace to all. Amen. And so as we each in our own spaces have our bread and our cup, I invite you to join together with me in prayer. God, we give you thanks and praise for your creation, your beauty, your faithfulness, your love. We especially thank you for your son, Jesus his ministry, his grace, his forgiveness, and his sacrifice on the cross and his resurrection for the world. We pray for new life for our world. We pray for all who are sick, all who have died, and all who are grieving. We ask your mercy and your grace. We pray for those who care for the sick and the lonely. Jesus, we pray your mercy and your love would pour out into our world, and that you would use us, your people, to minister and feed your world. And so we join our voices together and say the prayer you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. <clears throat> Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Just as he did by the lake shore that day, Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread and after looking to heaven and giving thanks, he broke it and he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup and he said, this is the new covenant, which is poured out in my blood for the forgiveness of sins. This is our Lord's table, our Lord's supper. And Jesus invites all who seek him to share in this feast with him. So in your own homes, and your own spaces, I invite you to take the bread and say the words to yourselves and to one another that this is Christ's body broken for you. And as you drink the cup, say the words, this is the cup of salvation. 
God's covenant of forgiveness for all. So, friends, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. Let us celebrate the feast. nowhere by accident wherever we go god is sending us wherever you go god is sending you wherever you go god is sending you wherever we go god is sending us so go now with the blessing of the god who feeds let us go out into the world to feed one another with love and forgiveness and food and go with the blessing of god almighty creator redeemer and sustainer amen <laughs>